Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, I realize that it may take people a few minutes to join, but I will just get started on the intro stuff while we are waiting for everyone to go ahead and sign in because we've got a lot to cover today. Um, so um, today we are hosting our first in the series of webinars on COVID-19 supplemental sick pay here in the state of California. Um, here you have myself and my colleagues, Anne-Marie Zalatel and Dana Howells from our LA office. I am here in Sacramento. Um, in terms of instructions, FYI, all participants are in listen only mode. If you have any questions throughout the program, please use the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We'll be holding a short Q&A session after the presentation, and we will also do our best to get to everyone's questions either during the content of the presentation or afterwards. If we'll follow up with you via email if we don't have a chance to address your questions during the webinar or Q&A session. For those of you interested in CLE credit, um, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation towards the end. Please write the code down. It will not be repeated and it is required for CLE credit. CLE su credit submission instructions, the presentation recordings, and the slide deck will be distributed to attendees in the days following the presentation. So please keep an eye out for those in your email. Um, legal disclaimer, this is not legal advice. This is all for informational purposes only. So if you want to ask us questions, especially in the Q&A, we love the term um, hypothetically speaking. Please don't reveal any particular uh, company issues in the context of the Q&A during this session. Uh, and there is the contact info for uh, myself, Dana, and Anne-Marie if you have questions afterwards and need to reach out to us. Um, so in terms of the subject matter that we're going to be going over today, um, first and foremost is the California Supplemental Paid Sick Leave, which I'm sure all of you have been dealing with relentlessly since the pandemic has started. Um, next, we get into the Cal OSHA Earnings Continuation or Exclusion Pay, which you may have heard it called. Um, and then we're going to be covering local California Supplemental Paid Sick Leaves, um, which um, may or may not be COVID related, and Hazard slash Hero Pay and Paid Leave, um, which you're seeing in a lot of the grocery and retail space. Um, so those are the four main avenues in which you're going to be seeing California COVID-19 paid sick leave coming up. With that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Anne-Marie. Thanks very much, Kobe, and good afternoon, everyone. So before I jump into the 2021 COVID uh, statewide uh, supplemental paid sick leave, I'd just like to um, this, go over a quick refresher. Back in 2020, there were two different statewide California COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave laws, uh, the food sector law as well as the non-food sector law. Um, both of these laws applied only to employers with more than 500 employees. Also, coverage was limited to those California employees who left their homes to perform work for a covered employer. So um, it did not cover employees who were um, teleworking and working uh, exclusively from home. Um, these laws provided up to 80 hours of uh, supplemental paid sick leave, which throughout the presentation, I'll just refer to as SPSL um, for covered employees um, for three different reasons. Um, if they were subject to a federal, state, or local COVID-19 quarantine slash isolation order, or if they were advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine or self-isolate due to COVID-19. 19 related concerns, primarily if they were um, exposed, um, came into close contact with someone with COVID, um, or if they were prohibited by their employer from working due to health concerns related to the potential transmission of COVID-19. Both of these laws expired back on December 31st of last year. Next slide, please. So a new 2021 um, statewide COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave law went into effect um, on March 29, 2021. So just earlier this year. Um, significantly though, it was retroactive to January 1st of this year. And what this means is that employees who took uh, sub, who took uh, time off work for a reason that is covered under the 2021 law um, between January 1st and March 28th, 
can make a verbal or written request to have this time off count as the 2021 supplemental paid sick leave. Um, and if it was unpaid, then um, they will be entitled to be paid for at the rate under this new law. If they took time off as regular sick leave or as PTO or vacation, then uh, the employer needs to pay the difference. Um, and also you would need to designate the time as COVID supplemental paid sick leave time and put the time back at their PTO slash vacation bucket or in their regular sick leave bucket. Um, this law as of now is set to expire on September 30th, 2001. Um, you know, the way things are going in California, I predict that that it likely will expire and that um, the legislature will not extend it. Um, the law has much broader coverage than the 2020 law. So this law covers employers with more than 25 employees as to opposed to more than 500 employees. The reason why the coverage threshold was so high for the um, other law is um, that it was really designed to fill gaps created by the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, um, which sunsetted back on December 31st of last year. So again, employers with more than 25 employees are covered. Also, this law covers employees who are unable to work um, or telework. So this time remote workers are covered. Um, initially when the law came out, we got a lot of questions about whether independent contractors are covered. And the answer is they're not, but you need to be aware because um, especially in California, the test for independent contractor is very stringent. And we're finding that a lot of um, independent uh, individuals who've been classified as independent contractors are in fact um, really employees under California law. So properly classified independent contractors are not covered. Um, another question that has been very um, popular is um, whether or not time that employees took under the old 2020 law um, counts against uh, time afforded under the new uh, law? And the answer is no. This 2021 law provides up to an additional 80 hours of SPSL for covered reasons, regardless of how much time the employee took last year in 2020. Next slide. So there are um, also additional reasons and that the 2021 law um, uh, provides coverage for. So an employee may use the statewide SPSL if he or she is unable to work or telework for, for any of the reasons on the slide, which um, I've grouped into to three different areas. Um, the first is caring for oneself. So if the employee is subject to a quarantine or isolation period related to COVID-19, and what this is, this is not a general stay at home order. This is um, an isolation or quarantine period defined by the California Department of Public Health, by the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or by a local um, health department or health officer. Um, you know, the, the most common example is um, if the local health officer has advised uh, individuals to quarantine or isolate if they have come into close contact with someone with COVID. Um, so they're not sick yet with COVID, but they have to isolate or quarantine due to a close contact or other exposure. Um, the second is if they've been advised by a healthcare provider to quarantine due to COVID related concerns. For example, if their um, spouse or significant other has COVID, their healthcare provider um, most likely will have advised them to, to quarantine. Um, and certainly if they're experiencing COVID-19 symptoms and seeking a medical diagnosis, that would be covered. Um, the next um, reasons are um, grouped into uh, really covered, uh, caring for covered family members. And the family members who are covered are, 
are the same family members who are covered under the regular sick leave law. It's a, a parent, child, spouse, registered domestic partner, grandparent, grandchild, or sibling who is um, subject to the quarantine or isolation period um, or advised by a health care provider to quarantine due to COVID concerns. Um, or next slide. Um, caring for a child whose school or place of care is closed or otherwise unavailable for re reasons related to COVID-19 on the premises. So if the school, um, first off, if the school is closed for summer, um, this reason is not going to apply. Also, if the school or place of care is um, unavailable for other reasons. Um, this reason does not apply. The school has to be closed or the school or place of care daycare provider has to be closed due to COVID-19 on the premises. Um, the next um, reason uh, that employees may use the time is if the employee is um, taking time off for a COVID vaccine to get the COVID vaccine or they've received the COVID-19 vaccine and they are experiencing symptoms um, that prevent the employee from being, or side effects from the, the vaccine um, that prevent the employee from being able to work or telework. Um, couple point, important points here. This has been a very popular question. Um, the law does not afford time off to get a child vaccinated. Um, but if the employee has regular California paid sick leave available, um, the employee may choose to take regular California paid sick leave because um, securing a vaccine for a child uh, does qualify as preventative care under the regular sick leave law. Next slide. Yeah, and, and one other quick thing that I, I've been having come up a lot, especially recently as the state starts to open up, is there are still some travel quarantine restrictions in place, particularly for unvaccinated individuals. And if someone has traveled and they're unvaccinated, they may be subject to a state or local quarantine order. And that, unfortunately, is also covered by this because they would be subject to a state, state or local order to quarantine, which is a qualifying reason for California supplemental paid sick leave. Right. Thanks very much, Kobe. That's an important ad. I got like three of those today. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in terms of the amount of, of sick leave, um, for full time employees, it's the same as the. The 2020 law, it's um, up to 80 hours of time. But again, these 80 hours are an additional bucket in addition to the time they received in 2020. With part-time employees, um, for those who have a regular weekly schedule, it's the number of hours that the employee is scheduled to work over a two-week period. So if the employee works um, 25 hours a week uh, over two weeks, he or she is scheduled to work 50 hours, and that is the amount of California paid uh, supplemental paid sick leave the employee is entitled to receive. Um, if the employee has a variable schedule, there's a formula that is used, and the formula is, is here on the slide. It's 14 times, so you multiply 14 by the average number of hours that the employee worked each day um, for you in the six-month period um, preceding the date that the employee um, takes the uh, SPSL. Um, and on your slide here, I'm not going to, to read through it because we really don't have time, but we've included some practice pointers for you and you will receive the slides. Um, some directions if you have an employee, a variable schedule part-time employee who has worked uh, for you for less than six months. Next slide. So the calculation of SPSL pay is um, it's uh, a little bit burdensome for uh, non-exempt employees. For exempt employees, it's the same as um, under the regular California paid sick leave law. It's basically you calculate it in the same manner um, that you calculate wages for other types of paid leave that 
exempt employees take the most common vacation PTO and um, most employers. In fact, I would say uh, 90 plus percent of clients I work with pay exempt employee paid leave time at the exempt employees base salary. You just continue salary. And so that's what you would do in this case for non exempt employees. Um, what the statute provides, and we were hoping the FAQs would would clarify this, but unfortunately they do not. Um, it the the sick leave uh, has to be paid at the highest of the following. So it's the regular rate of pay for the work week in which the employee takes the time, or you calculate pay by dividing the employee's total wages, not including overtime, by the employee's total hours worked. Um, in the full pay periods in the prior 90 days or the state minimum wage or the local minimum wage, whichever is greater. Quite frankly, it's really going to be the, the first two. Um, and what this means, since it has to be paid at the highest, you have to, um, under the law, perform both calculations and then use whichever affords the employee a, a, a higher rate of pay. Um, like the 2020 law, though, um, the pay uh, that you're required to provide, it does not exceed $511 per day or more than $5,110 um, in total for the 2021 leave. Next slide. So, like um, the uh, 2020 COVID sick leave um, Supplemental sick leave law and like the regular uh, statewide sick leave law, you're required to provide employees with written notice of their available balance, either um, in their itemized wage statement that they receive each payday or in a separate writing. Um, and what is especially important here is. Um, the balance available balance has to be listed separately from the regular California paid sick leave balance. Um, this is um, because the time uh, is that's available under the two statutes. It's for different reasons. So the, the laws require you to provide written notice each payday of each type um, of available balance. Also, there's a poster requirement, um, and we've included a, a link to the poster um, in the slides. Um, unfortunately, uh, and this question comes up quite a lot because um, a number of clients are experiencing uh, uh, leave abuse. Um, you know, mysteriously, uh, recently, a client reported that on Father's Day. Um, a lot of individuals happen to call out. Um, this is a retail client, so employees work on Sundays in stores, and you know a huge number of employees called out on on Sunday uh, this past Sunday for Father's Day, saying that they had been exposed to um, COVID and needed to you know take the supplemental paid sick leave because they were subject to a quarantine or isolation order. Um, generally, you cannot require documentation that. The DLSC FAQs do state, um, unlike the regular California paid sick leave law, there is an FAQ that states that it may be reasonable for an employer to ask for documentation before paying the SPSL when the employer has other information indicating that the employee is not requesting SPSL for, an, for a proper purpose. Um, so you have objective information that they've they're requesting it for an improper purpose. Um, what's important here, a couple points. First, you, you aren't able to deny the time off, um, but rather before paying the SPSL, you may be able to request documentation where you have some objective information. In my mind, the fact that it happened to be Father's Day is not sufficient. Um, the, Example that the DLSC gives is if an employee comes to you and says they've been exposed to COVID-19 and therefore are subject to a quarantine isolation um, period under you know the state order, 
um, or a local order, but then um, another employee reports that the employee was at, in fact at a public park on that particular day. The DLSE says that in that instance, it's reasonable for you to um, request documentation before you pay out the SPSL. And so with that, I am going to turn it to back over to Kobe to talk about um, Cal OSHA exclusion pay and how and the interplay between the regular sick leave law that I just dis discussed. Well, the COVID uh, sick leave law and exclusion pay. So for many of you, this has been probably a huge pain in your side um, for quite some time now. Um, Cal OSHA originally passed its emergency temporary standard on COVID-19 in November of 2020. Um, and they, it became effective in, on November 30th of 2020, and then very recently revised a new effective version of the ETS on June 17th of 2020. Um, the ETS covers all employers, regardless of size, um, absent certain kinds of industries. So it does not apply to people who are teleworking either from home or from a, a location of their choice. So if they're working at like a hotel because they're working remotely, it does not cover them. Um, and it also does not apply to workplaces covered by the aerosol transmissible diseases standard, which is typically healthcare related um, entities. But other than that, it applies to pretty much everyone else. Um, and so under the ETS, um, the emergency temporary standard, it provides for earnings continuation that it calls exclusion pay for employees who are excluded from work due to workplace related COVID-19 exposure or illness. That means that there's some indication that they got it from work, um, except that the burden is on the employer to prove with investigation and evidence that it's more likely than not that COVID-19 related exposure did not occur in the workplace in order to avoid exclusion pay. So if we get back to the Father's Day example that Anne Marie was giving in the prior slides, if someone says, oh, I got exposed um, to my family this weekend, then that would be sufficient for you to say it's not exclusion pay. But if you're in something like a retail environment or where it's customer facing, it's essentially impossible for an employer to really prove um, more likely than not that the person got it somewhere else unless they straight up tell you that they got it from like a fr they were exposed to a friend or a family member. Um, exclusion pay is not required if an employee is receiving disability or workers compensation benefits, um, but it is required um, if they if they're not getting that sort of thing. So um, you can require them to exhaust the California supplemental paid sick time that uh, Anne Marie was just going through. You cannot require them to exhaust regular paid sick leave um, that's provided pursuant to the regular state statute labor code 246. If you provide um, under the recent FAQs on the new ETS, they did say that if you provide a more generous paid sick leave policy, um, you may be allowed to require them to exhaust the extra paid sick leave time uh, prior to utilizing exclusion pay, but that's gonna depend on any applicable legal exceptions that may apply to you. Um, if you are going to not, if you have determined that someone is not eligible for exclusion pay for one reason or another, including that it is not contracted at, at work or that um, they're receiving some other kind of benefit, um, there is a new requirement under the new ETS that you have to inform the employee of the exclusion pay denial and the applicable exception. And we recommend probably doing that in a similar way to doing your AB 685 notices, um, notifying them of the other benefits that are available and why they are not receiving the exclusion pay. Oh, and sorry, I just went over that um, in terms of the um, what you can and can't do for the interplay with other leaves. In terms of the rate of pay, um, much like the California Supplemental Paid Sick Leave, it is required to be paid at the employee's regular rate of pay for the pay period in which they're excluded. Um, and it has to be paid in the same time frame. So if you normally pay them every other Friday, you have to pay the exclusion pay in that same paycheck that you'd be paying it. Um, this has, just as a practice pointer, has been creating some litigation uh, on, on the sick pay front, um, none of which, as far as we're aware, has come to any sort of judgments yet um, because the law on it is questionable. But um, where employees have variable compensation, um, their regular rate of pay could include things like commissions, incentives, et cetera. Um, and so that could mean that if they are out um, for one of these sick pay reasons with exclusion pay or under the California Supplemental Paid Sick Leave that Anne-Marie went through before, um, it could mean that their hourly rate while they're out sick or out on exclusion pay could actually be considerably higher than their normal base hourly rate. So you want to pay attention to that. Um, we've been getting a lot of questions about are there CBA exemptions if we have general 
um, very uh, generous sick pay provisions? And the answer is no. Uh, you have to uh, pay, provide this exclusion pay even if you have a CBA that has extensive paid sick leave provisions. Um, many clients are asking us, oh, this can't be right. Cal OSHA can't do this, right? Like, is anybody suing them? And the answer is yes, they've been sued by lots and lots and lots of people and the exclusion pay provisions and the testing obligations under the ETS, um, the injunction requests related to those were denied. So it is here to stay for the time being. And with that, I am going to pass it over to Anne-Marie. I'm sorry, back to Dana. Dana. Okay. Thanks, Kobe. Um, so I'm going to race through sort of the local supplemental paid sick leaves, which you also have to pay attention to. And the first thing I want to tell everybody is don't forget that these local sick pay that mandates that are not specific to COVID may still apply. For example, if an ordinance covers preventative care or taking your kid for preventative care, it's going to cover vaccines. So don't lose sight of the fact that you have to follow these pre-existing local regular paid sick leave laws that are not specific to COVID. I also want to call out um, San Francisco, Emeryville, Los Angeles, and San Diego because they all gave guidance under their regular pre-existing sick, law, sick pay laws that really expansively applied to COVID and actually um, expanded on the events far beyond what the regular ordinance covered. For example, um, all four of them cover vulnerable populations who are people over 60 if you're in San Francisco, 65 if you're in the other three locations um, that have a serious health condition. The serious health conditions are defined slightly differently amongst the guidances, but um, as you move through this, please Keep in mind that these are not sunsetting, so you've got to be aware of the jurisdictions that had guidance pertaining to their regular sick pay law. Next slide, please. So um, this is a list of the local sick pay laws. For details, um, please order a copy of our CalPEX ebook. I was the author of the section. <laughs> And um, there, there are gory details on all of these leaves. They're all different, um, created a tremendous amount of problems for multi, you know, multi-place employers within California that have lots of different locations. Um, as you will see, some of these have expired. Um, with San Francisco, only their um, public health uh, paid leave ordinance expired, their regular sick leave law still applies to COVID. Um, as you can see, some of them are going through September 30, some of them are going through June 30, um, but there's, they're all over the map. Many of them, and this is important, say that they're going to extend two weeks past the state of emergency. We now know that Gavin Newsom isn't ending the California state of emergency, and so you're constantly having to check to see if your county or city has ended its state of emergency. And as far as I can tell, none of them have so far, and I don't expect that to happen for some time. Next slide, please. So Marin County covers super small employers that are not covered by the state law which may be an interesting trend. Uh, many of the COVID-specific local laws were for big employers, 500 or more, because they filled a gap with the federal law. Next slide, please. So issues to watch out for, you've got remote workers and you've got your own locations. You really have to pay attention to both where their home location is as well as your location, your headquarters or your main location. City and county maps are great. They're my favorite tool. Um, we talked about when the state of emergency is over. The rate of pay can vary. Um, in general, the state rate is going to be higher, but you need to always check your local ordinance to see if the rate is different. Um, you need to check coverage. Um, you also need to check, again, for that special COVID guidance, which isn't going to sunset that we mentioned. Next slide, please. 
Finally, be aware that some industry-specific hero pay laws, which gave people who work in food and pharmacy, drugstore retail, um, a boost in pay, some of them actually cover um, paid time off. Either you can opt for paid time off, they cover um, paid time off for vaccinations. Um, so be aware that hero pay isn't just what you think it is. It also can implicate um, paid time off. We're going to give a separate webinar on hero pay. And I think that wraps it up for me. Great. Thanks uh, very much, Dana. I'm going to read the CLE code now for those of you seeking CLE. It is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 9492. Again, SS9492. Next slide, please. As uh, Dana mentioned, we are uh, scheduled to have a Hero Pay webinar. It's actually uh, next Tuesday, the 30th. And this slide lists a number of other CalPEX uh, webinars that we will be holding uh, over the next month or so. And um, we encourage you to register. Uh, next slide. Um, on this slide, we have information as to how to request the Cal Peculiarities ebook or to download um, a PDF of the ebook. Also, we really encourage you to subscribe to our blog. The address is at the bottom there. Um, we typically post um, every Wednesday, although um, with all of the developments, uh, COVID um, developments, uh, Fast and Furious, we've been posting um, as the developments happen. Um, and uh, if you register, you should be notified via email every time there is a new post. We also encourage you to sign up for our mailing list so you can get management alerts and um, learn of other programs that we will uh, be having in the upcoming uh, months and for the remainder of the year. And with that, I really just wanna thank all of you for coming. Our contact information is on uh, slide 23, which you will receive. And please don't hesitate to follow up if you have any questions. And thanks again for joining us today. And um, just as a reminder, we have a short Q&A session. Um, I, I've been trying to answer some of the questions as they've come in in the Q&A box, if you've been following along. Um, I know one of the ones that also came up in the Q&A box has to do with asking for doctor's notes where you're suspecting abuse of, of the COVID paid sick leave. And um, as Anne-Marie sort of hinted at, and when she was talking in her portion of the presentation, it's really, you really can't require proof or documentation unless there's some kind of um, objective reason why you suspect abuse. And so she gave the example of, um, you know, an employee reporting that the person was out of park. I think the most common one I hear or see about is an employee claiming they're sick and then they post a bunch of stuff on Facebook about being out at a party or going on vacation. Um, or one of the other more common ones that's perhaps a little bit on the fence, um, but one that we've seen coming up a lot are where employees just coincidentally get exposed to COVID like every Friday and Monday when they, <laughs> for like six weeks in a row. Um, so that would be a situation in which where you've got some kind of pattern of abuse that might you might be able to ask for documentation. But generally speaking, you really can't under the law, you're not allowed to do that, ask for documentation. And you can't decline the use of the COVID sick time um, and require them to use regular accrued time in, in response to the question, unless there's um, a reasonable, a real reason to suspect abuse. And Marie, did you have anything else to add on that point? You know, I, it's it's tough because there there isn't much guidance other than the um, you know other than the park example in the FAQs. I think for non-essential businesses you know, to curtail abuse, you want to, if they say they're subject to a quarantine order, if it's, you know, if they're calling out on Friday, require them to stay out for the entire period, um, unless they, uh, you know, in that case, uh, if, you know, you're following the, the, the state or local order, um, where I've seen this pattern though, is, you know, a number of clients are essential businesses and, um, and, 
they have employees get notes that say, oh, it was a false alarm. I, I you know, I thought I had COVID when I called out, but uh, it turns out I just had strep throat and I've been on antibiotics and now I'm better. And, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of questions about whether that is sufficient, um, you know, if it's the next Friday and what about three Fridays or four Fridays? And um, it's it's really hard, tough to know where to draw the line. Uh, you know, you're much safer if you have an employee, a coworker report. Well, I saw this person, you know, out at a party or the person was at Disneyland. Um, you know, I, I think, though, if you've got a pattern, if it's more than two and it's, you know, only on Fridays, um, you're not denying the time off. You're just asking for the documentation before you pay it. I think if it's more than two, um, then, you know, you're you're pretty safe, but it's it's hard to give definitive guidance and it really depends on your risk tolerance as well. And, and sort of piggybacking off of that, um, some of that is being resolved now as employers are, you know, encouraging employees to submit um, information related to their vaccination status, because if someone calls you and reports a close contact, but they're vaccinated, they don't need to be quarantined anymore. Um, right. And so, yeah, so if they're as providing they're not symptomatic. And so um, if you have uh, documentation that this employee is vaccinated because they don't want to be wearing a mask in the workplace anymore, then you can say, well, I'm sorry that your friend has COVID, but you're vaccinated, so you still got to come to work. Um, so that that's one of the ways to deal with that now. But you know that that wasn't something you were able to do if, even a month ago. Um, and if anybody else has any more questions, we'll stay on for another couple minutes. You can feel free to put them in the Q and A section um, or email us separately after. I'll just add a, a number of clients are have not have decided against mandating uh, vaccines, but a number of them either have or are exploring um, giving incentives uh, to incentivize uh, in you know employees to get vaccinated, especially now that the vaccine is is more widely available. They wanted to first see how many employees were just on their own going to go out and get vaccinated. Um, and so uh, if you haven't considered incentives, it's something that you, you may want to consider and we can provide you with um, information and guidance on what incentives are allowed and the parameters um, around um, offering incentives and, and the accommodations that you are required to provide if someone for a disability or religious reason isn't able to get the vaccine. Um, I also see some questions coming in about how much um, SPSL you would need to give, and that's going to vary depending on the employee's regular hours of work. So for an employee that's full time, it's 80 hours. For an employee that has a regular part time schedule, it would be the hours that they regularly are scheduled to work. And if someone has a variable schedule, um, it is going to be based on the number of hours they worked in. And was the last 90 days or 60 days. Um, it's uh, there's a formula you use. And it is on uh, one of the slides. It's 14 times, I think, the number of uh, days they've worked or the number of hours over six months. Oh, six um, months. Yeah, it's uh, six months preceding the, when they use the sick leave. Um, can you provide 80 hours to part time employees? Uh, yes, you can. Yeah, you can certainly allow them to have more hours than they're entitled to. Um, but you don't have to provide them the full 80 if they don't regularly work 80 hours. Um, for those who aren't vaccinated, um, do you have to tell them to quarantine and pay them SPSL for the time that they're on quarantine if you know they're not vaccinated and you know that they are traveling? Um, that actually has come up quite a bit. Um, and Technically, there's no affirmative obligation for you to tell them about the health orders. Um, however, um, for many of the clients that I'm dealing with, particularly where they know they have unvaccinated employees that are traveling to high risk areas, um, they are doing that because they don't actually want someone that's going to, let's say, Brazil and then coming back into the workplace and potentially spreading something that they may have caught during their travels. And so 
Um, I, for most of my clients that have that situation, they are in fact affirmatively telling people about the health orders, um, particularly where you know about it. Um, if you sort of play dumb and someone actually gets sick at work, that could be really problematic from a Cal OSHA perspective if the person was not um, quarantined from returning to work after that kind of travel. Um, for the SPSL, you do need to show the 80 hours or whatever the balance is available for people on not necessarily the wage statement, it could be in a separate writing, like another piece of paper that you give every pay period, but it does need to be given to people on some kind of a writing. And if someone has variable hours worked, um, like their hours fluctuate, you could put variable in parentheses next to the available balance. Um, that's permissible as well. Um, and we've got another minute or two if anybody else has any other questions. Um, this is thank you everyone for participating. We got some some good pressing questions that have been coming out a lot from a lot of companies all over the state. Yes. Okay. Um, oh wait, so we got one more. Oh, wait, now I'm having trouble scanning down. Let's see. Um, what happens if an employer pays the hours as the employee's regular hourly pay? I assume that means base rate as opposed to including like commissions and other types of incentive pay. Um, the employee has, if they if the employee realizes they've been underpaid, they can file a claim with the labor commissioner to recover the pay. And it's also an attorney's fee eligible claim potentially if they hire an attorney. So um, generally speaking, if you know, if it's not a huge, um, amount of difference, we'd recommend making the pay adjustments for the regular hourly rate simply because um, the risk of the litigation, if someone files a complaint, are actually pretty high and the exposure could be substantial. There's also certain statutory penalties associated with violating the weight, the certain provisions of the labor code that I'm sure you would prefer to avoid. And with the recent um, Cal OSHA ETS, for example, they also have recommendations that employees could potentially file charges of like systemic violations that the labor code is now, labor commissioner is now looking to potentially prosecute for employers that are violating sick pay ordinances in mass. So I would just watch out for that if you're um, trying to figure out how to pay people. Um, links to counties asking for vaccine status. That's actually a state requirement, not requirement, but under the Cal OSHA ETS, if you want to have employees be allowed to take off their masks in the workplace, uh, Cal OSHA, the state safety organization, requires that you have documentation of the employee's vaccination status. There are also some counties that are asking for it. Um, Anne-Marie, do you know, if we probably have, we do have a list somewhere of counties that are asking for vaccination status. Um, I think the only one that's like that stands out affirmatively to me is Santa Clara. Yeah, I think that's the only one in California. I think this, that's the only one that's that I think yeah. stands out to me. Um, and um, and is the 80 hours of supplemental paid sick leave in addition to regular paid sick leave the company already has? Yes, it's in addition to it. And you can't require people to use their regular sick leave prior to using the COVID paid sick leave, which is supplemental. Um, and with that, um, if they're not vaccinated, they have to wear a mask in the office. Yes, if they're, unless they're in a closed room that where they're alone, then yes. Um, and I think we've reached our time here. So if you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us. And hopefully this has been informative for you all and you have a great afternoon. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.